Good morning. I'm Afsane Mashaiki Beshlas, a board member of CGD. And I'm really excited that you are joining us today for this CGD event as we conclude President Biden's two day leader summit on climate change. The summit has been a powerful signal of the United States recommitment to doing its part in the global fight against climate change. Beyond just symbols, we've seen major announcements this week from the US government on the domestic and international side. Notably, the new Biden administration has committed to the US having greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 and doubling annual public climate financing to developing countries by 2024. The US International Development Finance Corporation is going to be a very key vehicle for delivering the US government's international climate agenda. The DFC is the US government's new full service development finance institution tasked with mobilizing private capital to address development challenges. The doubling of US international climate finance takes it from 2.6 billion per year to over 5.7 billion going forward. And the total annual DFC commitments will be about 6 billion per year going forward. I'm pleased to be here today with Dave Marchek, the COO of the US International Development Finance Corporation and a great friend. Dave has a long and distinguished career in law, in government and the private sector. I won't read his entire bio or it would take our whole time today and it wouldn't leave too much time for our discussion. But I will note that as the chief operating officer of the Development Finance Corporation, Dave is the architect of this young agency's mandate to catalyze development investment in poor countries around the world. DFC's investments focus on intractable challenges such as bringing energy to parts of the world that need it most. Um, I have also, um, like David, been focused on renewable energy for more than two decades at Rock Creek, at the World Bank and elsewhere. And in fact, Masood Ahmad, the leader of CGD and uh, myself worked early, early on uh, in uh, the climate area and clean energy. And so it gives me particular pleasure to see what um, Dave has announced this week and have to hear from him all the new announcements plus his plans. And so Dave, if you could kick us off today by giving us the highlights of your new plans, I would hugely appreciate it. Great, well, thanks so much, Afsana, and thanks to you, the longtime friend. I, if we were in a smaller group, I would say you're the smartest Besh loss, but I don't want that to get out to a large group. So, and don't tell Michael since he's not here, but uh, I'm thrilled to be here. And I'm also thrilled to have the CDG host this. Um, I can tell you that uh, the center is an organization that the entire DFC relies on. We consume everything they read. Uh, in our first couple of weeks, the new Biden leadership team spent an hour and a half with the leadership team at the CDG going issue by issue, region by region. And uh, the CDG is just such a source of knowledge and strength that uh, we love working with, with the organization. Uh, I wanna give a particular shout out to, to three folks, uh, Scott Morris, uh, Nancy Lee, and Todd Moss. They're folks that, that we talk to all the time uh, and in the last 10 days, as we've rolled out this climate uh, initiative, I've been on the phone constantly with them. So uh, really thank you for, for having me. Uh, we have um, a short slide desk. I, I, it's only like 70 or 80 slides. Actually, it's only three slides. So let, let, maybe you can put that up and I'll try to talk for like six or eight minutes. And then, um, great. So um, I thought it would be useful to start with a sense of our portfolio because we can lay out policy objectives, but we express those policy objectives through investments and they're transaction by transaction, project by project. And it takes a long time, as you know, to move a portfolio, as you know, in your, in your own business, uh, Afsana. So if you look at these, these charts very quickly, um, this is the existing DFC portfolio, the legacy OPIC and the first year of the DFC or first year and a quarter. Um, and if you look at the allocation by country income, you'll see on the top left, you'll see that uh, about 43% are lower income and lower middle income countries. The DFC is mandated by the Build Act 
to focus heavily on those. That's about 60 to 65% of our projects, but a lower dollar value. We hope that over the next five or six years, you'll see that number significantly increase. Then on the top right, you see portfolio by region. Again, we have a very, very strong exposure in Latin America. We'd like to grow our exposure and in, in accelerate investments, particularly in Africa and in Southeast Asia into China. So Indochina. So I think you'll see some changes in our portfolio over the coming years there. In the lower left, if you look at our overall portfolio, it's about $31 billion, depending on market valuations. About a third of it is energy. And about half of that energy investment has been in carbon. So in the coming years, I think you'll see a significant shift in the configuration of this with a very, very heavy acceleration of our investments in renewables and also in adaptation. And on the bottom right, you can see four or five areas. Clean energy, it's about 16%. We'll see that grow significantly. Um, health is about two or 3%. Actually, this it's going to five because we just made a big health investment. Gender equity, it's about 3%. And so I'm highlighting those because those are areas where the Biden administration will put a priority on those uh, areas. And we're gonna see hopefully significant increases in those sectors. So let me go to the next slide. So these are the areas that we've highlighted as priorities in the, in the new administration. Climate, I'm gonna come back to with my third slide. Global health, historically, it's been a very smart, small part of OPEC and DFC's portfolio. It's a small part of, of most DFI's portfolio. Um, we're very, very focused on increasing our spend, increasing our allocation to global health. We've already through the Quad, which is the uh, countries in the United States, Japan, India, uh, and Australia, we were, the DFC's uh, announcement was the centerpiece of the president's Quad agenda, where we're gonna be financing a very significant effort in India to significantly increase vaccine production up to more a billion doses primarily for export to Southeast Asia. We're actually working on doing the same in Africa where we can help drive vaccine uh, manufacturing in Africa to help drive more vaccine deliveries on the continent, not only this year and next year, but we'll be needing boosters for many years to come. So there's, we need more vaccine manufacturing all across the world, including in developing countries, and we wanna be part of the solution. We also have invested in insurance related to delivery of the vaccines where we have an insurance product which will be levered to essentially provide insurance to shippers going into about 50% of lower income countries around the world. And we wanna do more to invest in medical facilities and hospitals and surgery centers and also in health services, in telehealth. On gender equity, this is an area where actually the previous administration did a, a very good job. It was part of the 2018 G7 uh, summit. And the previous administration laid out a $6 billion commitment uh, to invest in women-led businesses or, or businesses with significant number of their leadership are women. We're actually taking our pencils and trying to come up with a new higher target, which will roll out in advance of the June G7. Third, a uh, fourth area is ICT. The Center for Global Development has written a lot on how technology has a huge impact on driving development. It's been a small part of the DFC and OPEC's portfolio, and we'll do more there. And finally, the fifth bucket is inclusive growth. And this really means investing more in lower income and lower middle income countries. And in higher income countries, investing in marginalized or lower income communities in those countries. So I think that you'll see a significant amount of focus on driving more dollars and more projects towards lower income and lower middle income countries. Final slide. So here's our um, climate agenda, which we announced this week. Actually, the president announced uh, the first two items yesterday. They were such significant uh, deliverables, essentially, that the White House wanted the president to announce them personally, which he did at the summit. Uh, and the DFC was uh, really what part of the centerpiece of the summit yesterday. So number one is, is a 2040 net zero commitment. 
And the word in this deck that's really important is credible. There are lots of commitments on net zero that from financial institutions around the world that they really don't have a clear path to get to net zero. What we did is we went asset by asset, project by project and measured the carbon output. And then we built in uh, um, into our model, our anticipated spend and the life cycle of our projects. And we will be the earliest DFI in any G7 or G20 country to get to net zero. Most of the others are 2040. So hopefully we can not only be a leader there, but also catalyze more, more uh, acceleration of that in other DFIs. Second is a third of our spend going forward will be on client, client, climate mitigation and adaptation. So that will be a significant increase in what we're spending. We actually had a transaction this morning with a very significant resilience impact where we're financing uh, basically houses in a low income country that will be climate resilient and also more energy efficient. The IFC has actually put out very good standards on this and we hope to drive um, more investments in not only housing that are climate resilient but also other projects, ports and other infrastructure. Uh, in the next week, we'll announce our first ever climate chief climate officer. We've announced a $50 million technical assistance fund. We've put out a call for private equity, venture capital, real estate, growth equity, and other funds with a climate focus. And again, we'll try to uh, allocate about a third of our overall investment in our funds program to, to, the, to climate. And we're partnering with the Rockefeller Foundation to drive investment in distributed renewable energy which are basically small modules, small uh, energy uh, development activity like solar and wind, not connected to the grid. It's a very, very hard market to crack. There's, everybody loves the market, but the amount of dollars going in is very, very small. And we hope to significantly catalyze investment and capital there. So we have a very, very ambitious climate agenda. I think we are leading the world in terms of laying out our, our uh, objectives in our portfolio. And I hope that over the next four to five years, you're going to see a significant shift in our portfolio as a result of these new priorities. So I'll stop there and hopefully we can spend most of the time in Q&A. That is amazing. I think, you know, if I just think about uh, what you have done in such a short time, Dave, it is uh, really remarkable. And if we could just start on the climate side, there's so much to cover uh, based on what you just shared with us. But on the DFC's commitment to the net zero emissions by 2040, uh, which is one of the most ambitious, if not the most ambitious uh, target I have seen uh, for any G7 or G20 development finance institution. Can you give us a little bit more detail on how you plan to achieve that target and what will you be doing differently? Sure. Well, first we uh, establish the baseline. So we have, as I said, we have about a third of our projects are carbon related, uh, about a third of our overall portfolio is energy related. And within that, about half of that is carbon. So 16, 17% of our overall portfolio. When you invest in a power plant or a carbon project, they have a long life. So what we did is we, we measured the output, the carbon output for each of those projects including to the end of the life cycle of that project. Some of them go all the way to 2042. Then we measured our anticipated new spend on carbon related projects, which will be lower, but we are gonna to continue to finance highly developmental projects. We have one in the, in the pipeline right now, which will electrify a th about 25% of, of one of the lowest income countries in the world where the electrification right now is only 15%. So we, we then modeled so-called carbon sinks. So we've invested in a number of forestry projects and other projects which actually reduce uh, carbon output and we modeled those. What we didn't include in our model was any technology improvements for carbon capture. We hope that in the coming years, there will be significant technology improvements for carbon capture but we didn't see them at commercial scale right now. And so we basically said, we're gonna have zero, uh, mod no technology uh, in our modeling because we wanted to have a very conservative approach. And then finally, we did not model or include something which is basically called carbon avoidance, which some folks have modeled, which is basically saying, 
if we don't do this carbon project, we take credit for it. So to me, it's like, you know, eating fried chicken and a diet Coke and saying, I'm not getting the calories from the fried chicken. So we had a very, very careful and cautious methodology. Now, one of the things we debated a lot was how do you deal with new carbon investments? And we've basically modeled continuing the most highly developmental projects through 2030. And so the type of investment that we'll pursue is the one that I mentioned where you can have a very significant impact on people on the ground that don't have access to carbon. This will be primarily focused in, in Africa and some in Southeast, South Asia. Let me give you some data, Afsana, which is just truly incredible, which is part of the reason we, why we approached it this way. If Sub-Saharan Africa is not part of the climate problem. If you take the entire Sub-Saharan African region and you tripled electricity consumption tomorrow, they would, and all 100% of that came from natural gas, that region would contribute 1.2% of global carbon emissions. Another data point, which I love with, since I have a 17 year old boy as Scott Morris does, is that gamers in California consume more electricity every year than the entire country of Ethiopia. So we believe that we can achieve climate objectives and also achieve our development objectives by having a very, very high standard for the type of projects that will continue that have a carbon nexus, and then significantly accelerating our investment in renewables and adaptation, which will end up leading us to net zero by 2040. And we'll publish our methodology and others can critique it. We actually did internal, um, you know, the Mary Boomgard, who is a longtime DFC OPEC staffer on, on the environmental side, she's been working on our GHG emissions for years. And we basically subjected her to kind of an internal dissertation defense. And then inside the US government with the special envoys office, Sec Secretary Kerry of the White House and others, basically attacking her plan to make sure that it was credible and it stood up to scrutiny. I think this is, uh, you're putting your finger on, you know, some really important uh, topics um, in the uh, climate debate. And I think you and Nancy have uh, been very busy this week. You alluded to some of it, um, about uh, some of the conversations about renewable with zero carbon emission with uh, compared that with natural gas, which has some, but also the fact that in some of the poorest emerging markets, you have a lot of local natural gas. So, um, and you know, you, a lot of the time, if you look at A to Z of total um, production, as you said, um, and the metrics that you're using, it will be very interesting to see exactly uh, the, in, the positive and the negative, but also adding it all up. So I think this is a really important debate. And um, I wanted to thank you for um, bringing it to the fore because it is uh, such an important debate among uh, you know, climate experts. Um, so moving right along, I think one of your mandates is also to move up some of your portfolio or more and more of your portfolio, as you said, to the poorest countries. And then within middle income countries, as you said, to, uh, to concentrate on lower income populations and target them. And I assume if you're working on climate, you're working across all nations and you know, all countries. Can you talk a little bit more also, you know, how the exceptions will be according to the BUILD Act and how your, um, how the agency plans to balance these, these two goals also? Sure. So the BUILD Act prohibits us essentially from investing in upper income countries. There's one exception uh, in the European Energy Security and Diversification Act, which is basically a, a, a helping Eastern Europe uh, become more energy independent. Most of our focus will focus on lower and, and lower middle income countries. And then in upper middle income countries, the next tier will focus on those lower income parts and marginalized community. And we'll also focus on particular areas of focus. So infrastructure, climate, uh, gender 2X initiatives and others. So, you know, most of our projects focus on low and lower middle income countries. In med the challenge, as you know, from your, from your World Bank and, and IFC days and, and as the CGD, CGD knows, is 
it's hard to put large amounts of capital to work with projects that tend to be small. So by project vet numbers, our uh, focus, our allocation to lower and lower middle income countries is much higher. The dollar value tends to be higher in uh, upper middle income countries. So the net, the third tier. So we are basically working to expand our pipeline in lower and lower middle income countries. We're working with MCC, USAID, TDA to do that. We will use the new authorities in the Build Act for technical assistance to hopefully drive our pipeline. And we're basically trying to do more outreach. So for example, um, Andy Herskowitz, who's our chief development officer, he's initiated these town halls across Africa where the ambassador in a particular country will host a meeting with small and medium-sized businesses, with banks and others in those countries. And we will talk about the DFC's tools and resources. And I think we've done 15 or 20 of these and we'll continue to do those all around the world. And my basic view, and you know this from your private sector career, and I know this from my private sector career, is business development is a team sport and you need to have a huge, huge funnel to generate actual transactions. And you know, at some investment firms and some DFIs, you might look at 50 or 100 opportunities to do one transaction. And so what we're trying to do is expand that funnel, enlarge our aperture so we can drive more capital. The other thing we're doing is we're trying to do more with um, other DFIs. So in the last few days, I actually have been on the phone and email a lot with uh, Mokhtar Diop at the IFC, and we are working on a couple of projects. And so we're trying to work across with other development finance institutions. We're trying to expand our aperture. We're working across the US government with our partners. And if folks in the CGD network have ideas for projects, please send them. I hope everyone who's listening, and we know there is a huge number of people who are um, here today um, listening to your comments, Dave. Um, I'm sure they will um, chat us later um, for questions, but also send you their list of uh, potential projects. But as you were just saying, I was thinking you have also been doing a lot in uh, thinking about how to leverage, as you just said, the private sector, but, and, and the fact that uh, the DFC's goal is also to have this catalytic role. So how specifically do you think in the climate area also, you will be you, working more closely with the private sector? And you know, what do you think the leverage effect of every dollar that you put out will be? Will it be three times, four times, 10 times? So it's a great question. We spent a lot of time on this. The leverage impact depends on the product. So if you think about our different products, there's less of a leverage impact from insurance. There's a little more from debt and there's even more from equity. Um, you know, equity, our new equity authority, that can drive a huge amount of capital. So if you think about climate, um, right now we're investing, this year we'll invest around five or $5.1 billion. That's our fiscal year, which is a October 1st to September 30th uh, date. So I anticipate that we'll, we'll increase our investment, let's call it six on average over the next couple of years. I'm hoping we do more, but let's say six. So if a third of our investment is focused on climate, that's $2 billion a year. Over five years, that's um, uh, $10 billion. And I think that we can mobilize 30 to $40 billion of private sector capital with that in the climate space with the multiplier effect, depending on the, the type of, of project that we pursue. So again, equity is gonna have a much higher multiplier than debt, which is gonna have a higher multiplier than insurance. But I think we could have a very, very significant uh, impact. So you mentioned equity and equity has been sort of that area which is really in great need for a lot of these projects, but DFIs in general, but also you at DFC have some limitations. And are you doing anything about that? How do you see the role of equity moving forward, particularly on the climate side? So um, equity authority is one of the new authorities in the Build Act. As you know, the law was passed in 2018. We consider January 1st of, of 2020 as day one of the DFC. Mm -hmm. um, 
This year, we're on track to invest about $250 million in equity. Um, we hope we can increase that. Um, we'll invest in both funds and in some direct equity deals. We anticipate that we'll invest about a third of our investment in, in equity in climate-oriented uh, activities, both mitigation and resilience. Um, there is an issue with the treatment. It's a kind of esoteric budget issue. Actually, Scott Morris with CGD wrote a great blog on this the other day, where the, the level of uh, leverage, essentially. So if, let me just back up. Congress appropriates us a certain amount of money every year. And then that money is allocated to either insurance, debt, or equity. And the budget scoring rules allow a multiplier effect for each of those products. So insurance, you can take a dollar and multiply it to a certain number, debt the same. The way that equity is treated under current budget rules is it's one to one. There are folks in Congress that wanna change that. Senator Murphy actually introduced a bill uh, in Congress that was debated on Wednesday in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee that would take the same treatment for debt and insurance and apply it to equity, which would allow us to invest much more equities, somewhere around seven to 10 times for every dollar. And so if that law is passed, and again, I don't wanna predict what Congress will do, it will allow us to significantly expand our ability to invest in equity. Right now, it's about $250 million per year. I hope it does, because like you said, it's a, such an important part of the capital structure and has been a real issue across all DFIs in general. So that will be really, really helpful, I think, to the causes that you're working on. You mentioned Scott Morris. Um, he and Nancy and others at uh, CGD have also written a lot about the fact that uh, it's really critical that the multilaterals work together and cooperate together. You know, obviously, climate is a big area, but health and other things that you talked about. Do you want to touch a little bit more about how you plan at the DFC to be cooperating more on climate, but other other areas uh, with the DFIs, and how you see that um, you know deepening in terms of your engagements with the sure. multilaterals? Let me give you an example of just a great collaboration uh, in India, and in this in this investment we just made, uh, we just were pursuing in Biological E, which is the second largest vaccine manufacturer in India. So this was in the context, and this is a, a microcosm of what I hope we can do more of, and we're actually doing it in Africa as well. Um, so this was in the context of the Quad, which is the leaders of the US, Japan, Australia, and India. The National Security Council created objectives we then worked with the State Department, HHS, CDC, and other agencies within the US government to identify opportunities. The State Department and the NSC communicated with the Indian government. And the Indian government identified a, a number of potential partners. The State Department then went out and met with each of these agencies, each of these companies, and basically gave us a list, and then we started working with them. And through that work, we identified an opportunity to use our financing to drive more than a billion doses of vaccines to be manufactured a year in India for, for export around the world. So that's a great example where, you know, DFC is a small agency, but we leverage the technical expertise of HHS, CDC, FDA, and others. We leveraged the diplomatic power of the NSC and the State Department. We leveraged the embassy to develop contacts. And we worked with the government of India to identify uh, opportunities. And then we worked with our partners at in Japan and Australia and those DFIs to basically say, we'll focus on this and, and you focus on other areas. And together, we're gonna try to drive more dollars towards the entire ecosystem for vaccine manufacturing and delivery. So others are going to focus on cold storage and logistics. We focused heavily on manufacturing. That's an example of what I hope we can do in climate, in health, 
in technology, in gender, and in each of our priorities. That's so refreshing, Dave. And I know from my work uh, on the board of Gavi, you've also been very helpful in terms of uh, sort of on the insurance side and other areas uh, on risk mitigation, looking at the whole uh, COVAX and, and, um, and delivery of vaccines, as you just said, your work on India, but really more globally in the poorest countries. Yeah, we've done a lot of work with Gavi and this insurance product that actually Jim Poland on our staff created. It basically, Gavi has a requirement that each receiving country for vaccines has insurance coverage. And through this insurance structure, which will be leveraged uh, by multiple investors, we're essentially providing the required insurance by Gavi for about half of the developing country, uh, developing countries that will receive vaccines through Gavi. So thank you for your leadership on Gavi as well. No, but thank you, because I think this, um, the, this risk mitigation is going to be critical, as you said uh, earlier in your comments, in terms of, it's not just a one-time delivery, this will be a continuous thing. Um, as um, I have uh, um, one or two more questions to go on, uh, I just wanted to remind our audience also, please continue to send your questions uh, to CGD uh, Dev, CGD Talks, or via YouTube, and, um, and we will get to them uh, and get Dave to answer your questions as well. Uh, so, um, as you were speaking uh, earlier also in your comments, you mentioned the 2x efforts and your work on gender really that works across everything from climate to health, of course, to, uh, to getting uh, delivery of internet and, um, and technology to, um, to all populations, including uh, lower income uh, women in many of these countries. Did you care to talk a little bit more granularly on what you think might be happening? What should we expect? You said in June from uh, your future statements in this area. Sure. So uh, this is an exciting area where um, the DF DFC can actually do great work. So first of all, institutionally, we started uh, from a good base. So the previous administration and the career officials at the DFC have done a really good job at driving gender investment mm -hmm. and creating criteria through the G7 for how to define it. Mm -hmm. um, we actually, when we came in, we put uh, a person named Algene Sajuri in charge. She's one of the most senior Biden appointees. She spent 18 years uh, on the Hill and was uh, policy director for the Senate Foreign Relations Committee under Senator Cardin. She's in charge of this. So we, we wanted to send a signal by putting one of the most senior Biden appointees in charge that this was a priority. What we're doing now is we're trying to do a few things. One is trying to create a gender lens for every investment. Two is drive more dollars um, towards 2X initiatives. Third is where uh, Algene has done a great job with her team of kind of creating gender lens training, gender investing training that uh, investment officials at the DFC are gonna undertake. Mm -hmm. And then we're working across the board to drive gender investing. So this morning, uh, a, we uh, had a review of a transaction uh, involving a, the only female um, led venture fund in a particular region. I can't announce it now, but it's very exciting. We are, are doing a lot of work, particularly in the SME area, of working with financial institutions and intermediaries around the world where we will provide capital to a financial intermediary and essentially require them to lend a certain amount to women or women-owned businesses. Mm -hmm. It's particularly exciting in certain countries where women can't even have title to property or access to kind of legal documents. And so we're creating extraordinary change uh, across the world through our, our small and medium-sized lending initiatives. And so the big news I think will come at some point in the future when we announce our new target, but I, even though I want Scott and Nancy and others at the CGD to be happy, I'm not gonna do that today. <laughs> well, we expect that when you have your announcement, you will come back to CGD to make that announcement. Absolutely. Uh, good. So um, one more question for you is, um, you know, um, like um, a lot of the things you talked about in your original chart that you put up, 
everyone talks about energy infrastructure, all the hard stuff, you know, building bridges um, and other things as very important. And of course, um, they are very important. But could you talk a little bit more about uh, the health sector? You did touch on that as being a very expanding part of your programs and whether it's health, but other things that are not necessarily hard infrastructure. We saw that also in the president's infrastructure plan, um, having looking at the topic of infrastructure much more broadly. Um, I'm curious to see how you're thinking about it at the DFC today. Sure. So we're starting our health focus with the crisis of the day, which is COVID, and really trying to figure out anything we can do to help provide solutions to the problem that we're seeing all over the world. You look at India and the extraordinary numbers of infections right now, which you know is scary for, for that country and scary for the world. So we're hopeful that by driving dollars into the market there for additional manufacturing, we can help provide a long-term solution. Um, second is the insurance product we mentioned. Third is we're actually talking to companies about problems in the supply chain. So the manufacturers of vaccines, it's not just that they can't manufacture enough. There's not a lot that they're having problems with supply chain, even things down to the type of plastic bags that are used in pharmaceutical grade manufacturing. And so we're trying to figure out whether we can help drive capacity to unchoke the supply chain. Next is more in kind of what you would consider facilities. So health facilities, surgery centers, uh, clinics around the world. We've done this in Africa with great success. These tend to be small investments because they're local clinics or a local hospital. And then the third area is in services. So telehealth. We all know from our own situation, we're still sitting here on Zoom, that telehealth has become part of our lives. And so if you think about hard to reach areas in developing countries, if they have access to the internet, um, telehealth and other services can be quite, quite uh, a game changer. And so we're looking across the board, we're partnering with uh, HHS and other agencies, and we're reaching out to health experts in the region, uh, in the regions in which we operate to try to get more ideas of what we can do. Actually, the White House has done a really good job. Beth Cameron is the uh, Senior Director for, for Global Health and National Security Council. She brings together a group which includes folks at AID, MCC, the State Department, HHS, the other agencies, BARDA, to help shape our priorities and give us access to their expertise. And we have an extraordinary person named Naf Nafisa Jawani who leads our health work and she is very plugged into that community and she's driven a lot of this activity. So I'm very excited about what we've done and, and we have more things in the pipeline, which I'm, I'm excited that, to share with you in the future. Wonderful. Um, we're starting, we have a lot of questions, um, Dave. So um, right. one of the questions we have for you is, how can different businesses beyond those in the finance sector, um, including private equity funds, infrastructure funds, et cetera, work with the DFC in, your, in the new capacity and the new structure that you're creating? Great. Okay, so um, we have a funds group um, led by Lin Nguyen, and uh, we actually put out a call for applications just last week for private equity, venture capital, growth, real estate, infrastructure, basically any intermediary for capital to apply for, uh, to be considered for those funds. Um, and then we also outside of climate have a general open application process where if you're operating in the countries in which we uh, invest and you have a compelling both track record and a compelling narrative about how your investment actually drives private sector catalytic development activity, please call us. Um, you can go to our website and you can just look for funds and you can get in touch with one of our investment officers and you start the process. And so really, we hope that we get more funds to talk to us. We hope our pipeline expands and we hope that we can do more in this space. 
Wonderful. Next question for you is, um, you talked about the carbon accounting standards and you mentioned you'll be publishing the methodology. Do you have a timetable for that? And what uh, will be the interagency sort of comments on the timing of those anyways on, um, on the standards? So we, we're still not even through the climate summit. Today's day two, but I, I anticipate that we'll put more information out that you know, in the in very shortly, and we would love to have comments on that. We've already consulted with a number of environmental groups and others on this, and we expect that you know, if we if we need to make changes or improvements, we this is a learning process for us, and so we welcome input and we'll adjust if if there are problems in our approach. Um. So. Um... Uh, next question is, uh, you know, there is a strong argument uh, about the overall size of the DFC investments being not, not necessarily the size being as important as the targeted focus of the investments. And you have the three objectives, invest in highly impactful uh, projects, uh, advance U.S. foreign policy and continue the consistent record of generating returns for the American taxpayer. Oh, if you look sort of um, across all the different sectors are you going to be it says you know uh, the question is uh, are there particular sectors uh, and particular regions that will be your priority to achieve these objectives sure so our largest sector where we allocate capital is is in the financial sector because we drive microfinance and small and medium sized loans because as you know in your business asana which smart started very small and now is a very large business you know, small and medium sized enterprises, particularly in the developing world, drive employment. And so that's our largest sector. I expect us to continue to invest a lot in that space. We also invest, you know, heavily in infrastructure, in ports, in infrastructure, which have a catalytic impact um, on growth, jobs, development. And then the areas that I identified, um, many of which are very small er traditional areas of OPIC and then the DFC's allocation. So you know, health, we'd like to significantly, significantly expand our, our investment there. Technology, the same. Gender 2X, we have, you know, I think very ambitious plans. Um, and then this whole area of, you know, driving more towards small, uh, medium-sized enterprises, and then particularly in lower income and lower middle income countries. So that's, that's our frame. And that's where we're, we're orienting ourselves. And I think that, you know, it takes, a, as you know, in your own business, it takes a long time for, to develop the pipeline for your new priorities to kind of filter their way through the pipeline. I think you'll see the portfolio change in the next year. I, um, it just takes a little time and it's a big organization and, and it, you know, will, it's hard to, it takes a little time to steer. And you talked a little bit about um, Africa, obviously, um, you touched on LATAM in earlier, but if you look at both um, a, the Asian countries where you plan to do more and LATAM, are there any particular ones that you're looking at more strategically? So I think we're underweight in Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. It's an area of important growth and it's an area of strategic importance for the United States. Um, India is our largest single country uh, counterpart. We have about two and a half billion. It makes sense because if you look at, you know, the top 20 developing countries, um, top 20 economies, India is by far the largest economy in which we can operate. Um, so I think you'll see much more in Southeast Asia. We're very focused on the Northern Triangle. Uh, we have a lot of projects there. Vice President Harris has convened meetings that I've participated in. We're about focused on driving more capital there, particularly in small and medium-sized enterprises and agriculture and health. If we can expand economic opportunity in that region and housing as well, um, it, it will reduce pressure on migration. And so we're very focused on that. And then also Sub-Saharan Africa, which is always a priority. And that's where you know, the bulk of, of opportunities lie in terms of lower income countries and lower middle income countries. Wonderful. Um, Dave, uh, we have a question for you about your new chief sustainability officer. Can you tell yeah. us a little bit more about the role and uh, how that position will evolve? Yes, so we decided to create this position because uh, 
of our climate prioritization. There's never been uh, a position like this. It's gonna be a senior person in the front office that will have several layers of responsibility. Number one, to articulate and drive the vision for uh, our climate initiatives. Number two, to work across the government on an interagency basis to coordinate policies and then also to um, drive implementation. So we work closely with USAID, with MCC, with the uh, uh, Secretary Kerry's office and with him personally, uh, with the National Security Council. And this person will have primary responsibility to coordinate among different agencies on climate. Third, to work with stakeholders on the issue. And fourth, ultimately, to help drive business development. Um, so we want this person to, once we can travel again, to be on the road, hustling opportunities, going to all the places where we want to invest and trying to drive projects to get in our pipeline because ultimately that's the way we express our policy priorities. So uh, I'm very excited about the person that we have in mind. Uh, we actually have, well, I'll, I'll stop there. We, we have a lot more we're gonna One do. One more, another announcement. Yes. So. Absolutely, we'll wait for that. Um, Related question is, um, what can you at the DFC do to address this huge dual crisis we have, which is the enormous debt burden in the poorest countries, as well as, um, as the climate um, issues that they're facing? And, um, and when you look at that, to what extent do you see the DFC working with other entities um, in the US government or multilaterals, et cetera, on providing some sort of grant finance component in addition to the financial instruments that you've been telling us about today? I'm gonna let this ambulance go by for a second. Um, of course. So um, we actually have done a couple of creative um, debt for nature swaps. Mm -hmm where highly indebted countries can lower their level of debt and use some of the savings to invest in uh, environmental protection. So that's an area where we partner with certain environmental organizations and it's a very creative approach and I, and I hope to do more there. And then your second question, I'm sorry, I, I was bothered by the ambulance. Of course, of course. Uh, I, think, I think the question is really, uh, this debt burden is huge and you, know, you have certain tools that you can use, but you don't necessarily have access to all the other tools on the grant side. Are you working with other institutions to, um, to um, expand yes. on uh, finding ways to deal with the debt burden? So, I mean, we work closely with the Treasury Department, with the State Department um, on those issues. The Treasury Department obviously has to lead on those issues. You know, we're, we're very project-based to the extent that a project can help mm -hmm. um, with the debt burden through the type of things where we've talked about for this nature for debt swap, that's the type of thing we can do, but it's, but it's gonna be you know, targeted prioritization. I think the treasury will take the lead in this area. Makes sense. Um, another question for you, Dave. I know Nancy is Lee as a former treasury official would get mad if I said anything different. <laughs> That's right, exactly. Um, so um, in terms of the optimal mix, uh, in your new climate investments uh, between mitigation and adaptation. Do you have any thoughts at this point or it's going to be very bottoms up? I think it'll be very bottoms up. I think the renewables market is an area where the DFC has invested a lot. Actually, Elizabeth Littlefield, when she ran OPIC, really did a great job of driving a lot of investment dollars towards renewables. It dropped off in recent years. We hope to pick that up both in terms of larger scale, industrial scale renewal projects. Um, for example, in Senegal, you know, we find us a few projects that provide almost 20% of the electricity in the, in the entire country. Mm -hmm. So we hope to do more large projects like that. Then also in these microgrids or, or distributed renewable energy with the, where we're partnering with the Rockefeller Foundation. So I think we wanna drive more dollars there. Adaptation is, is a new area for DFIs. In fact, we had a G7 meeting today where we talked about how to define adaptation, how to um, pursue transactions. You know, the CDC has done really good work in the space of, of defining what adaptation means. And then actually on an investment committee call this morning on a particular project, we had a long discussion about how to drive more dollars um, 
in the housing area with an adaptation component. So I think that adaptation is an emerging area. It's one that DFIs are just figuring it out. I think you'll see us do more in that space, but I'd say it's an area where we're learning and we wanna work with the private sector to drive activity in this. I think we'll be helping to define this space. So I'd, mm -hmm. I'd say more to come. Wonderful. Um, we know that the, you know, the Chinese infrastructure uh, bank has, um, has been very involved over the last few years in some of these areas, but also some other areas that have been more controversial, including uh, financing, for example, coal power plants in emerging markets. Uh, do you see any of your work also trying to influence uh, to influence them not to be pushing coal into the poorest countries? And are there any thoughts about that? So I'm hoping that our, the way that we've laid out our ambitious climate agenda will catalyze activity from other countries. Um, you know, we've laid out a plan to significantly expand uh, capital allocation to renewables uh, and adaptation. We've worked closely to, we've briefed uh, all the G7 and other major um, DFIs. We're, we'll work with the G20. And I'm, I'm hoping that, that what we've done will help drive activity. The other thing is we have a very different model. You know, our model is private sector, non-coercive development capital um, driven by folks on the ground who have projects with whom we can partner. And so that's a very, very different model than kind of state-run uh, development, which has, can be more coercive. And so I think hopefully our model is one that developing countries, the feedback that I've received in my short time here, developing countries wanna work with us. They, our projects, you know, have a long track record of success. And I'm hoping that what we do will serve as an example for others around the world. Dave, uh, when um, you're not busy running the, the DFC as the CEO, um, I remember last year you were uh, teaching a course at uh, Dartmouth uh, uh, School of Business, and um, you were looking at managing uh, multiple mo uh, stakeholder um, interests, a subject that has become very, very important and obviously has private and public sector um, relevance and I don't know if at that time you thought you would be in this position, but I'm just wondering, I heard a lot about that course and, uh, and a lot of the people that you had come speak, such as uh, John Finer, who's now President Biden's principal deputy national security advisor. What are the lessons from those discussions that might help shape the conversation at the DFC or more broadly? That's a great question. I, I was privileged to teach at Dartmouth. I always like to teach at places that I couldn't get in as a student. So, um, and my class was on managing stakeholders. Um, and we've had great speakers, actually, David Rubenstein spoke, uh, Jeff Zients was a speaker, John Finer, we've had incredible speakers. Um, I actually think that I'm taking what I taught and using it in practice at the DFC. Mm -hmm. So for example, on the climate debate, um, on our climate initiative, we had a very, very interesting consultation earlier this week that uh, several CDG mem uh, senior officials participated in, where we had leading environmental figures, CEOs of environmental organizations, uh, former climate negotiators, et cetera, and leading development experts. Two different communities with different objectives. And we heard a very, very different approach to the climate issue mm -hmm. with some on the environmental side saying, we're not going far enough with respect to our climate ambitions because we still include um, targeted, highly strategic, highly developmental carbon projects. And others saying energy access is the key and we still have 800 million people without access to energy, 565 million of those are in Africa. We still have a couple billion people without access to energy to have clean cooking. Mm -hmm. And the DFC has a role in driving that. So I think that you know one of the great things about this job 
is I get to work with stakeholders from many different communities. And hopefully I can do a good job with my colleagues. We have great people that help um, managing different stakeholders to drive our development objectives. So I'm sure that uh, the CDG, CDG will be you know, writing and observing and, and helping. And uh, I'm hoping that, that we do a good job. It's a great agency. Uh, I'm privileged to be part of it. And it's incredibly mission oriented, which is something I wanted to do uh, at this stage of my life. Wonderful. And when do you think you'll be back at the office sitting in offices across uh, your team? I don't know. I think that's going to depend on, on you know, the health situation. The, the Biden administration has been very, very clear mm -hmm. that they do not want people coming back until it's safe. And so for leaders like me at different agencies, there's basically been a strong emphasis on having us work from home because if folks like me come into the office, then it sends a signal to others that they should come in and not everybody has, has had their vaccine, not everybody has access to you know, being safe. And so right now we have very few people at the DFC, basically the security people, the IT, um, some of the systems people, and then the operations folks and you know, I, it's a tribute to them for essentially coming in and creating risk in their own lives to serve the agency. Um, and, but we, we're, we're not gonna come back until it's safe, but it, that's, that's a decision that's above my pay grade and, and we'll look for guidance from the, the OMB and, and others, OPM on when that'll happen. Well, I wanted to congratulate you and wish you all the best as uh, you move forward with actually implementing these great uh, objectives and the new plan and, uh, and hope that the DFC will continue to be even more successful moving forward. And uh, thank you to, your, to our audience and to our friends at CGD, to Masood, to Nancy, to Scott and everybody else who worked so hard to bring us together today. Thank you, Dave. Thanks again, Asana.